Now let us try to understand conjunctive normal form. Before understanding con conjunctive normal form, we must understand few terminologies. Uh, we call a propositional variable as in atomic formulas. A literal is either an atom or its negation. A literal can be a variable P or it can be NER. And a clause is disjunction of the electrons. And since a, a disjunction is uh, associative, commutative, and absorbs multiple occurrences, a clause may be referred as a set of literals. For example, the P is an atom, but not of P is not an atom, it is a literal. And we will consider both P not P and P as literals. The following is a clause. You may see that P may occur multiple times, but it is whole, this whole thing can be viewed as a set of literals where P occurs, not P occurs, and Q occurs. Therefore, writing a clause as a set has same meaning. Now what is a CNF formula? CNF formula is a conjunction of clauses. Since conjunction is also associative, commutative and absorbs multiple occurrences, a CNF formula may be referred as a set of clauses. Since uh, not P and P both are literals and they are single con disjunction of literals therefore they themselves are clauses and they are conjunction of a single clause therefore they are also a Siena formula. Now let's look at this formula. It has clause, another clause and here is another clause. So this is a conjunction of three clauses. This is also a CNF formula. We may view this uh, conjunction of three clauses as a set of clauses. Furthermore, each of these clauses itself can be viewed as a set. So a CNF formula can also be viewed as a set of sets. And that's when you are writing algorithms. So it often understood the CNF formula is a set of sets. Let's suppose if I give you a formula F which is not in CNF, there is a transformation which produces another formula F prime that is in CNF and F and F prime both are equivalent. How do we achieve that? So first what we do, we remove these symbols, uh, XRs, implications and equivalents using the standard equivalences which we have discussed earlier. Then what do we do? We convert the formula in N and F as we have already discussed with removing these variables, these symbols. Now we are left with only AND, OR or negation symbol. Since it's an N and F, so all the negations are on top of variables. And all other structure is using only two connectives, AND and OR, a conjunction or disjunction. And what do we do to do is we need to flatten them. What do I mean by flattening? Let's suppose we have this situation. We have a conjunction and it is, and there are two conjunctions below them. So what do we do? We basically uh, have a formula F1 f2 f3 f4 what do you do we create one one conjunction with f1 f2 f3 and f4 after this transformation our formula looks like this it will have a sequences of uh, disjunction conjunction disjunction, conjunction, alternative change. And at the very end, you will have a 
literals where the variable can be p and not p or q now the problem is the, why this formula is not in a cnf form because there is a disjunction here which is setting above a conjunction which we don't like what we can do we can apply distributivity property when where the disjunction distributes over conjunction and we apply the disjunction and reverse the order of conjunction and disjunction and therefore we will obtain a cnf formula let's look at an example let's look at this formula first we need to get rid of this implication signs first if we do that we get this form once we have this formula what we have is uh, notice this disjunction is sitting on top of this conjunction we need to switch their order so what do we do we distribute and after distribution we obtain this formula transform into these two clauses and we have a formula in cnf form once we have done this transformation it's very intuitive to see that this works however we should ask ourselves do we have a complete procedure why this may not be a complete procedure see when we do this transformation we apply distributivity and distributivity has this problem then we take a formula and we apply distributivity it produces a larger formula and again we may need to apply distributivity on another sub formula somewhere where the conjunction and distinction in a wrong order so how do we know that this procedure is going to terminate the problem is each time we apply the transformation we produce a bigger formula which may have a lot more may potentially have a lot more work to do and this process may never terminate however intuitively we know this is impossible so how do we make an argument that this process is going to terminate? So let us see how we make that argument. So the theorem says the procedure of converting a uh, formula in CNF always terminates. How do we do it? For a given formula F, what we can do, we can assign a measure how complex this formula is with respect to CNF, how far it is away from being CNF. How, what is the measure? The measure is how many times OR and AND has been alternating in this formula F. And that is the measure or we can call it height of that formula. And we give the symbol mu. Let's suppose in formula F there is a form sub formula G which looks like this. In this formula, disjunction is sitting on top of conjunction, which we don't like. So we want to transform this formula Fg such that it, it gets closure to the CNF formula. So what do we do? We apply distributivity. You can easily check, then we apply this distributivity on this formula G, we obtain this formula G prime. It's a significantly larger formula uh, which has lot many more conjunctions and and for each of the conjunct you have a disjunctions we can notice that that these formulas will certainly have a smaller height than G okay now if that is the case we will use this fact to prove our theorem so the few observations you must make g prime is either the top formula it may be basically it, g is the g is f is setting the top formula or the parent of this formula is a conjunct remember that we have a sequence of disjunction conjunction disjunction conjunction okay so g is this guy right 
So above G must be a conjunction. Another observation is G I J is either a letter or a disjunctive formula. So at the leaf point, okay. So below these guys, you have a G I J. Okay. So this guy should be either a disjunction or already you end with some letter. Okay. So when we do the transformation, what will happen? What will happen is G I J is a disjunction and the guy above it is conjunction. So we need to do flatten of to flatten these guys out to make a single flat structure so that we go back to this form. So after the flattening uh, we will go back to the form when we have a conjunction, disjunction, conjunction, disjunction and so forth. Once we have this transformation, uh, once we have this uh, procedure in place, what we what are we doing? We are taking a sub formula out and replacing with another sub formula, which is larger. But notice that it has elements which has a shorter height in terms of our measure. So, so what we can do, we can apply coin lemma to prove that this procedure always terminates. Well, you may be wondering what is this going lemma and suddenly why I'm bringing this up. So it's, it's slightly involved to see why going lemma, what is going lemma and how it is going to apply. But let me give you another example. Okay, Once you understand that example, it will be very simple to see what, what's going on and how a going lemma can potentially apply here. Consider this exercise 7.5. Uh, let's suppose you have a bag of balls, okay? And each ball has a level of positive number. And what we can do, we can take a ball out from this bag and replace with new balls, which have a label less than the label of the original ball. Now you can put as many balls you want. So you cannot put infinitely balls back. And if you do that, the claim here is some point of time you run out of balls in the back. Why that is the case? It's very intuitively it's very clear. Each time you take a ball out, you're putting balls which have a smaller label. So each time you have to put smaller, smaller labels, some point of time you will hit one and you take a one out and you cannot put anything else because there's no positive number smaller than one. This process has to terminate. Similarly here, you're transforming a formula into another larger formula, but it, the subterms of this new formula have a smaller height. Therefore, it is going to terminate. Now, how would you prove this exercise 7.5? Please look at the slides at the very end of this deck and you will find the theorem Cohen's lemma and see how you can apply the theorem on exercise 7.5. Now let's look at a few more notation about a conjunctive normal form. If you have a single literal, okay, for example, not P, you call it unit clause. If you have exactly two literals in a clause, then you call it binary clause. If you have a three literals, for example, not P or Q or R, then you call it ternary clause. In a similar way, you extend the definition of the clauses to empty set of literals. What is the meaning of empty set of literals? If you think for a second, you will realize as you add disjunct, things and things more and becoming more and more true. Therefore, empty set of literals should be interpreted as false. So in our notation, we will say, uh, we will say false as an empty clause. 